Well, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Uh, let me warmly welcome you to this, uh, uh, this event uh, as uh, part of the uh, Borlaug Dialogue. Uh, I'm Nafiz Mir. Uh, I'm the regional representative for South Asia, and I'm going to be uh, the moderator for this session. Uh, we've got about 90 minutes uh, for this, and uh, hopefully we'll have a, uh, a very fruitful discussion. Well, I don't need to tell people that we're at a particularly important time, um, important juncture, uh, due to COVID-19, uh, which has brought us to a position where we're having to reassess the strategy for food and nutrition security, uh, as well as sustainability. Uh, of our agri-food systems. So this year's dialogue is themed breaking new ground, uh, building resilience today for improved global food systems tomorrow. Uh, and this will attempt to provide regional perspectives and scenarios about the implications of COVID-19 um, on the resilience of agri-food systems. Uh, we'll also be highlighting the importance of uh, accelerated development of uh, investments and partnerships for research in agriculture uh, to uh, future-proof uh, the food system um, uh, from the crisis like the one we're facing today. We've got a really good panel, an esteemed panel, and uh, they'll be sharing their respective viewpoints uh, on this issue, uh, followed by a moderated discussion and a Q&A session. Uh, so throughout the program, uh, you're uh, invited, uh, encouraged to send in questions, uh, and we'll be we'll be uh, considering those through the uh, Q and A Zoom chat box. Chat box. So before I go any further, um, I'd like to uh, 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 play a short video detailing the uh, COVID nineteen impact on the rice sector and how uh, rice-based economies have responded to this challenge. Thank you. There are very few places in the world that the COVID-19 pandemic has not yet reached. In developing countries, COVID-19 has further exposed the vulnerabilities of poor communities. Disruptions in the food value chain, on top of livelihoods lost, pose huge risks to food security and the sustainability of agri-food systems. The rice sector is not spared. Smallholder rice farmers around the world now experience limited resources and even more limited access to farm inputs. Rice exporting countries are also cutting down on exports to prevent supply shocks and to ensure that they have enough for their populations. Rice-based economies in Asia and Africa are not only reeling from the effects of COVID-19, but are also dealing with existing and new challenges that have yet to be addressed. To this end, the International Rice Research Institute interviewed its stakeholders across the regions to get a big picture of their situation with hopes of sharing their voices beyond boundaries. Many initiatives are already being implemented by agriculture actors to allay the compounding impacts of COVID-19 and other challenges. In Africa, Kenya is experiencing its worst locust outbreak in 70 years. This, coupled with the pandemic, will definitely put a strain on the economy. Neighboring countries like Tanzania, Burundi, and Mozambique are threatened by a food crisis should further trade blockages occur and agricultural production contract. Governments in the region are fast implementing interventions to mitigate the risks of COVID-19 and provide food for even the most vulnerable. In Burundi, the government has updated its rice strategy to include new developments in the rice sector. Development partners have also been quick to respond to the situation and have provided support to farmers at the preventive level. They have helped introduce crops or varieties of shorter cycles, increase areas covered by their interventions, and increase the volume of input allocations. South Asia faces many similar challenges, but favorable weather conditions in India 
have led to record rice production and harvest during the pandemic. Neighboring Bangladesh has also reported sufficient food supply, contingent on timely planting and harvest. Issues in logistics, however, have had a negative impact on domestic and international rice trade. Labor shortages are also pushing governments in the region to ramp up initiatives on mechanization. In light of the pandemic, Nepal has proposed a five-point policy for agriculture development, farmer subsidies, accessible and affordable credit, technology service for farmers, crop and livestock insurance, and guaranteed profits. Development partners have allocated budgetary support for COVID response in the region. This has helped minimize the impact on vulnerable populations, particularly crop and livestock farmers. Multiple stakeholders are also providing enhanced support for Southeast Asia, which has seen increasing COVID numbers in recent months. In Myanmar, the Myanmar Rice Federation, Myanmar government, and other stakeholders have done an effective job to stabilize the rice market and balance supply and demand. Indonesia and the Philippines, two of the worst hit in the region, face several major challenges in the rice sector. At the beginning of the pandemic, the Indonesian government attempted to stabilize prices, build a buffer of major food stocks, establish social safety nets, and facilitate farmer financing, among others. Indonesia is now implementing its strategy in the medium term, followed by initiatives for the long term. There are also several organizations and universities in the Southeast Asian region that have devoted their time to studying COVID-19's impact on the rice sector and the policy recommendations needed to address the situation. While comparably more resilient, East Asia saw a decrease in agricultural budget for China, while South Korea's overproduction problem remains a key challenge. The Chinese and Korean governments, however, have been active in ensuring food security and working with development and bilateral partners on several projects to achieve this. China and South Korea, together with aid agencies, have also been quick to assist countries in the Global South. Collaboration and partnerships among governments, the private sector, universities and research institutes, and other stakeholders including women and the youth are key to safeguarding our food systems. Multisectoral partnerships will indeed be crucial in informing policy decisions and future directions as we work together to build back better for food systems resilience and transformation. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, colleagues. Uh, so this video, video highlights uh, some of the results that we got from uh, some interviews, key stakeholder interviews that Iri carried out over the last few months. And hopefully it's given you uh, uh, some idea of the uh, measures being taken by governments uh, uh, in addressing the consequences of the um, uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and how those shocks have uh, impacted the populations. Now we want to use this, uh, uh, this uh, event, this side event, to explore uh, some of these issues and get the perspective uh, of, uh, from our panelists uh, um, on, on these. Now, at this point, I'd like to um, invite our panelists to introduce themselves, uh, their work um, and how the pandemic has uh, affected their work. So start, may I start with um, uh, uh, the World Farming Organization, followed by uh, my colleague from IRI, uh, followed by the uh, representative from the Indian Agriculture Ministry, uh, the representative from CGI system, and finally, Last but not least, Agra. Please. Thank you, Nafis. Um, hello to everybody. Good morning or good evening, who knows, based on where you are. Um, my name is Ariana Giuliodori, and I am the Secretary General of the World Farmers Organization, an organization that was born 
because of the will of the farmers of the world to have their voice represented in global processes. The organization is based in Rome next to the UN Food and Agriculture Poll and is uh, um, participating in all the international processes from um, SDGs, definition and implementation to climate change negotiations. And for sure, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic had a huge impact uh, both on the way we work, uh, forcing uh, all of us to move to the remote working options and digital options, but also what we're doing, trying to support our members, providing them with uh, practical information, timely information and uh, support in their daily activities. Thank you, thank you uh, for that. Uh, can I move on to my colleague um, from Miri? Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Jean Ballier. I am research director at the International Rice Research Institute. And uh, well, as many of you may know, IRI is uh, the premier uh, organization uh, on rice-based system uh, research. And we, we very much focus on uh, transforming rice-based systems for better livelihoods uh, and to address the, the multiple challenges of, of rice-based food systems uh, spanning from climate change to uh, equity issues and uh, increasing prosperity. So for us, the pandemic means that uh, we have additional you know, work to address the multiple facets of this crisis and to uh, provide support to the broad rice-based sector. It also means operating in a more challenging environment for us in research because we have less opportunities to interact with colleagues and partners, which makes, makes you know, all these possible solutions more difficult to achieve. Thanks, Jean. Uh, and if I may move on to our colleague from the Indonesian Ministry of Agriculture, Dr. Hussein. I'm afraid that Dr. Husnain is in the attendee link. So, Dr. Husnain, if you could check your email and uh, uh, log into the panelist link, because we will not be able to hear you with the link you're currently using. So, okay. Nafis, maybe somebody else can introduce okay. him or herself. So, um, if I uh, could uh, introduce briefly Dr. Husnain, she's from the Indo uh, Indonesian. Uh, uh, agriculture Ministry. Um, if I can move, uh, uh, I'll invite, and once she's connected back on to say something about herself, but if I could move on to uh, uh, the representative from the CGIR system. Hello everyone, my name is Ekaterina Krivonos. I'm a Deputy Director for Programs at the CGIR System Organization. I'm based in Rome. And uh, I will speak later on about the CGR COVID-19 hub, because of course, as the pandemic unfolded, we saw the need for a coordinated and integrated approach as one CGR to respond to, to this crisis. So we'll speak a little bit about how we are managing to coordinate and really draw from the full system capacities to address the country needs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and, uh, and finally, to uh, the representative from Accra. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. I'm calling from uh, Accra. Um, my name is Foster Boateng. I'm the regional head for Accra in West Africa. Uh, I think Accra is an African institution and uh, our role here is work with governments, uh, work with CGIs, work with um, research, uh, farmers, and the private sector to be able to improve Africans' agriculture. Our aim is to look at inclusive agricultural transformation. We pick the technologies you develop for last mile delivery and also work with government to improve on policy. Uh, COVID-19 has really affected our work because uh, we do last mile delivery. So we work closely with farmers and with restrictions and with protocols. Now face-to-face -face interaction with farmers become a challenge and you need to resort to digital technology. and. Uh, in not all places that farmers have access to some of these uh, 
technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Foster. Uh, have, have we got uh, Dr. Hussein yet uh, on the on the panel? I'm afraid she hasn't uh, been able to log into the uh, session here uh, yet, but uh, she's also no longer logged in as an attendee. So we have hope. Good, good. Uh, well, in, in which case, I'll just uh, briefly say that that she's the director of the Indonesian Center for Agriculture, Agricultural Land Resources Research and Development. Uh, when, when she comes to speak, I'll uh, ask her to say a little bit more about um, uh, about her her background and what she does. Um, well, first of all, uh, we have an excellent lineup of speakers. We're going to, I think, be excited to hear more. Uh, fr from the panel about what they have to say um, about the broad scenarios, about the actual experience um, uh, on the ground. Uh, and to start the discussion, I'd like to invite uh, Ariana from the World Farmers Organization to give her presentation. Um, the presentations will be about 10 minutes. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, uh, once the uh, presentations have been finished. Ariana, over to you. Thank you. I will share my screen, hoping that this works properly. So let me know if you... Yes, the screen's there. Is it okay? Yes, it looks Okay, good. wonderful. So if we can quickly go to the following slide. So I see someone is controlling the presentation. Thank you very much. So I have already uh, told you um, how much COVID has impacted the way we work, but I'd love to um, expand a little bit on this. Actually, COVID-19 has represented a real shock for the old food systems, as we know. Um, in terms of farmers, they, we were not so much affected by social distancing. I mean, as our members always say, farmers tend to, be, tend to implement social distancing by nature on, on the farm very often, but the economic lockdowns, the travel bans, the, the boundaries that were all locked, everything created dramatic effects on the value chain and food systems. And we are, uh, as you all know, um, assisting to millions and millions of additional people thrown into the ghost of hunger. Um, but at these terrible times, farmers have never given up. And this is the first point that I would like to highlight in my contributions. They were recognized more, almost everywhere as essential workers. But first and foremost, without any official recognition, a farmer cannot stop, nature doesn't stop, and neither do the farmers. So the first thing that WFO um, implemented as soon as we were thrown into this pandemic um, vicious circle was to give voice to these farmers that were keep on producing and keep on feeding our communities worldwide with a campaign on social media highlighting their role. So uh, exactly like we are honoring nurses and doctors, we're also thanking farmers for continuing feeding us in, in, in cities and, and communities. Um, and if we can move on to the next one, I would like to um, discuss with you and share with you some more about the impact of COVID and what WFO has been doing and is still doing. Unfortunately, we are, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, in order to serve our members, as I was saying in my introduction, we created what we call a COVID-19 agri-information hub, where we are gathering unfiltered, farmers-driven, farmers, uh, farmers' information. So our members are sharing with us their stories their experiences, their challenges, and we gather them in this global hub based on the main chapters, the main challenges that we have identified. Starting with health issues for sure, for both uh, the farmers and their workers, logistic challenges, disruptions in the market, financing, insurance challenges, and access to input. So these are the main, I would say, categories of challenges that farmers are facing. 
But I think that it's also very important not to forget that in many countries, in most of the developing countries, by the way, farmers belong, that's the paradox, I would say, belong to those who are hungry. So farmers, those who are feeding the world, are also those who are suffering hunger. And COVID has put additional pressure on their shoulders um, and they are really operating under extreme conditions. If I um, ask, uh, sorry, please, if we can move on, move on and to the following slides. Um, I, try, I try to be as short as possible to give space to all of us to share stories because I'm really, um, I'm really keen to know more from the other excellent speakers in the panel, but I'm happy then to take questions if there are any. So here I would like to share with you a few stories, stories from our member. So experiences that, as you can see, uh, will be from different regions of the world, different countries, different continents, but they have something in common. So the first thing that I would like to share with you is that COVID has also forced the farmers to think out of the box. And if the markets were not so accessible anymore, farmers have to find a way to bring their produce to the consumers. So COVID has been an incredible lever to accelerate um, this um, gap bridging between farmers and consumers with organizations that have improved in the direct selling tools, uh, online selling tools, and uh, home deliveries. Here you can see some examples from Italy, for instance, but many, many farmers' organizations in, uh, in several countries, both in the developed and developing world, have been operating in this way. So next slide um, will uh, we'll tell you uh, some more about another challenge that farmers um, are facing everywhere. The first, I would say, challenge the, the challenge of protecting themselves, so the health challenge, I would say, and protecting the people that work with them on the farm. Here you have two examples, one from France and one from Rwanda, where farmers of organizations have used their, uh, their power to access tools that are fundamental for uh, each, each one of us, like for instance, uh, face masks or soap, uh, in order to make them accessible to a lot more of small farmers um, and members in the organization. Um, maybe um, it's worth mentioning and recalling that at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the um, access into um, masks and, and protections was very difficult. So there was a shortage in the market. So using the strength of a farmer organization allowed to overcome the difficulty to have access to this product. Same happened in France, Rwanda and elsewhere in the world. Uh, next one, please. Um, the following slide is about something that I'm particularly proud of. And it proves that it's not only about resilience and food security, it's also about feeling part of a community and being in solidarity with your fellow citizens. And everywhere in the world, when produce was left on, on, the, on the farm because of issues related to logistics and, and disruptions in the value chain, well, everywhere, here you can see Japan, South Africa, or Italy, well, everywhere in the world, we saw farmers joining hands and taking those produce from their own farm and take this, this produce to the most vulnerable communities and people um, in the suburbs of, of big cities or in uh, remote rural areas. So this means that this, this was only avoiding um, excessive food losses uh, at the farm gate, because I can tell you that one of the issues that the farmers have seen was that uh, it was really impossible to take their product that was ready to sell to the final consumer. So, these experiences that I shared with you so far, if we can move on to next slide, prove 
how committed the farmers community is worldwide. We've learned a lot for this pandemic so far. But first of all, all at a sudden, food has never been so high uh, in the public opinion attention. All at a sudden, everybody in global north or global south was paying attention at food and where it comes from. And we saw images that we thought uh, impossible in some countries of the world where shelves were empty, even in the US or, or in Europe. So food as a top priority. Second element that I want to highlight, we realized that food comes from the farmers first and foremost, and that's not so obvious. And farmers are aware more than ever of the role they play in the food systems. I also would like to say that farmers have learned a huge lesson about how important it is to embrace risk, to take for sure with precautions, but to make a step, bold step towards the other, the other in the communities, the other in the value chain, in order to ensure that we can deliver on our mission. And finally, uh, the pandemic is teaching us all actually, not only the farmers, how interconnected we all are. And, and the theme of food systems that today, World Food Day uh, is, uh, um, I mean, in the media everywhere with the big summit that is uh, uh, waiting for us in one year from now. So food systems have been uh, uh, tragically highlighted by this pandemic as fragile, interconnected, uh, and in desperate need for innovation uh, in order to be more sustainable. And if we go to the next one, that is also my last slide, I would like to um, launch a message and a call for action to the farmers first as economic actors that are involved in this challenge, but also to all other actors, both in the research world, in the value chain, in civil society, governments, we must leverage this momentum. COVID must be seen not only as a huge threat and a tragedy for so many of us across the globe, but also as an opportunity to improve. So the idea of building back better must be at the very heart of everything that we are putting in place now, these weeks, last during the recent uh, past months and what lies ahead still. So business as usual is not something that we must aim at, at all. And therefore, we need innovation. We need innovation as a driver for sustainability. We need new forms of innovations, not only technology. I mean, yeah, sure, technology is one big chapter in the innovation, but we need to innovate business models. We must innovate relationships in the value chain. There is a lot. And that's why it's so important. And I'm so honored and happy that you invited the farmers to be with you today. That's why it's so important to highlight the role of research in strong connection with, with the economic actors, particularly the farmers. Because, and that's my final take from COVID and looking ahead to food systems, we cannot have a healthy planet with healthy people if we do not have also a lively agricultural sector. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nafis. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Um, I think you've highlighted, you've set the scene extremely well, highlighted uh, a, a number of issues. And one of the things that uh, you mentioned, which I think resonates very strongly, is uh, the bottom-up innovation that already happened uh, with a lot of farming communities uh, throughout the world, different countries, uh, in the global north, in the global south where farmers with the disruptions had to connect to their markets and did so in very innovative, innovative ways. But thank you very much for that. <clears throat> I'm sure it will generate a lot of questions. And just to remind people, if you do have any questions, put them in the chat and then we'll come to them in the uh, Q&A session. Thank you. If I can uh, move on to our next speaker, our next speaker is Jean Ballier, uh, Director of Research at IRI. Uh, and he will be sharing with us some of his team's work, uh, looking at foresight-related uh, research 
and how this can play a role in policy reforms, both in the short term and in the long term. Jean. Thank you, uh, Nafiz. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yes, this will be um, an attempt to provide just an overview of what could be done uh, using some uh, research products to uh, inform decisions to uh, uh, build back better our food systems. So uh, I would try to present a number of uh, work streams that we have been working on uh, and that could inform the discussion. Um, next slide, please. So uh, to start with, I, I think it's good to recall that before the pandemic, food systems were already challenged uh, and in many cases considered broken because they were not delivering on their promises and multiple level health and nutrition and sustainable uh, impact uh, on the environment and so on. The pandemic has only exacerbated these challenges and the COVID-19 uh, has and continues to have tremendous effects on the ability of food systems to operate effectively. What is more is the pandemic threatens to reverse years of progress uh, on poverty, uh, as you can see, but also hunger, uh, education, and so on. So I think it's worth taking a few seconds to repeat the numbers because they are, they are, they are really in parallel, I, I would say. The world is, as many know, facing the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, has caused nearly, uh, uh, nearly 4 million job losses globally. The real GDP of, uh, of on average, uh, uh, is projected to decline by 4.2%. World trade, and it was mentioned already, is going to, or is expected to plunge by 13 to 20 or more percent. Uh, and, and countries that rely on remittances, for example, like the Philippines, are, are, are going to see these, these remittances shrink uh, by at least 20%. So that is massive, is, is unprecedented. So while, while, while it was said, the impact has impacted everyone, it has affected the world poorest and the most, and the most vulnerable people the most. So uh, I, I think that all this, uh, all this is actually just a call to actually try to find innovative solutions and how, how we can use a number of the research, you know, packages, tools to use, including foresight and modeling to build back better our food systems and make them more resilient to future shocks as they will inevitably occur. Next slide, please. So here I basically is a menu uh, about what, what could initially could be uh, uh, done to to, to uh, better to, to actually build more resilience food system in the future. First, there is a need for, for a global assessment. I think we have the numbers, but they are still very preliminary. We need to have a more detailed uh, 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 analysis of, of the exact impact. The absence of a global assessment limits severely the ability of, of decision makers to, to act and, so, uh, uh, and to put in place recovery policies. So there is an urgent need to conduct a holistic and systematic review of the impact of COVID at multiple levels. So for food systems, there is a need to identify the key fragility points, logistics, supply of inputs, labor, uh, but also nutrition, uh, incomes, uh, and, and also to docu document the nature and the scope of the disruption that the pandemic has, has actually imposed on the different actors of the food systems. Then there is a need, uh, a need to identify the real impact pathways of COVID. We are still unclear about how the, 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 these effects have propagated, what were the entry points and how they have been uh, multiplied. Uh, so there seems to be a need to recognize that impacts have varied and they have been more acute in some areas for some people than others, health workers or the logistics uh, paying the high price. So there is also a need to analyze the policy and institutional governance responses to COVID to learn what has worked and what has not, so that we can identify policy options on this, this you know, building back better. So foresighting can help on that. Uh, altogether, uh, we could include, you know, uh, uh, 
simulations of the different economic uh, uh, recovery scenarios uh, that can help, you know, situate the ag sector within, within the broader economy, because we know that this COVID-19 is, is having impacts throughout the economy. So we cannot take agriculture in isolation. Uh, we can also provide through foresighting uh, uh, evidence-based recommendations to, to inform policymakers and, and try to better adapt and respond to this short-term impact, as well as reconstruct you know, a system for the long term uh, and make it more resilient. N next slide, please. So here is, is, just, is just a slide to show uh, some of our work on the pathways of COVID on rice systems. So we have not covered the whole food systems, but this is rice. It is basically a simplified analytic framework to, to look at uh, uh, the, the way value chains, rice value chains have been, have been impacted. Uh, of course, food systems are much more complex uh, than that and with more, many more entry points, backward and forward linkages. Therefore, more vulnerability points that are not always immediately discernible needs to be uh, 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 identified. Here we show how we to go from the risk and vulnerability assessments at the bottom uh, uh, to actually understanding the key drivers uh, that include, for example, markets, transport inputs, all those are, are parameters, are variables that can be used in our foresighting and, and in our modeling to actually uh, anticipate a number of, uh, a number of impacts. Then we look at uh, the channels through which these are, these are uh, um, communicated to the rest of the, of the system. So that, for example, looks at the, the, the role of the processing segment as opposed to uh, the production segment and the implied supply segment, and try to look at you know relative relative importance of these and their impact on a number of outcome variables such as you know production consumptions. So we know that consumption has been in, impacted both in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality in a number of of cases. And we will come back to that. So just this as a framework. Next, please. So here is just another way of presenting the same thing, trying to, to, to recall that consumption has been uh, uh, impacted through panic buying and stockpiling. We have seen a number of price effects, but we need to model as well, try to look at the patterns and the behaviors of actors like consumers, but also producers, you know, uh, but have had difficulties accessing inputs. We also have seen a number of ripple effects from the weather shocks in some locations. So how to actually integrate these uh, uh, biophysical models with economic models. And we also have looked something that was not necessarily well covered before in some of the research is the critical role of the middle level that is somewhat sometimes defined as the hidden uh, middle. And we have, I think, realized the importance of all these segments of the value chain, the role that that traders, uh, logisticians, transporters uh, play in actually the, 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 in making the, the, the value chain operate effectively. And that is something that we have had to actually recalibrate on our model and make sure that we realize the critical importance of this segment and also about the policies that are there in place to actually uh, protect or support these, these roles. Next slide, please. Talking about policies, uh, basically also to, to say that we have an array of, of, of policy decisions that were made, basically with a, a main, main pattern that was to uh, try to uh, come back to more food sovereignty. Uh, that is not without problems and it's not without tensions because we have seen that export bans uh, can have created a, num a number of problems for other countries. So we do have uh, a, a problem of, of um, ripple effects and also collective action problems. But we, all, 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 we have also seen a number of governments investing in, in better controlling the, the, the future through uh, uh, more investment in technologies, digital agriculture, modernization through mechanization, making uh, food systems more resilient. Next, please. 
So here's just a sign, uh, an example of the findings that we had. I think it was already mentioned, but through our, our, our collection of information, we clearly found that for Asia, the main problem was nutrition, uh, an impact of COVID on nutrition. So uh, less quality food being consumed, while in Africa, we have seen a quantitative effect, actually, more, more food security issue with less quantity of food available and a higher price. Next, please. So here is what we call about, uh, we, we mean uh, with, with the scenario building. So we have worked around these kind of three broad scenarios trying to look at trends and the main variables that are actually impacting the, 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 the functioning of the, of the food systems. So we look at the inevitable trends, including the lockdowns that are again occurring, uh, temporary or permanent collapses of health service, the, the speed at which the economic downturn is, is happening or the recovery is happening in some cases. And you have a number of uh, additional considerations for health uncertainties or economic uncertainties. So these are the variables that we try to capture to try to uh, uh, inform a number of scenarios that uh, on, on a context by context basis can help us uh, anticipate possible futures and, and can also help uh, um, decide what could be the best possible responses to uh, uh, build back better. So I cannot cover uh, in this time, you know, all these various variables, but this is just a hint about what, what is, is being done. Next, please. So uh, I already mentioned that, so I will, I will be quick. Uh, issues already considered concerns that the trade and labor mobility, we know that uh, uh, labor restrictions have been impacting a lot production. So we have models that in our models, we have scenarios looking at that, uh, the depth of economic downturns and economic recovery, uh, what happens if the economy uh, shrinks altogether, all sectors are being impacted, what would happen to the rice sector in particular, uh, the role of the middle segment, as I said, and it's, it's importance for the, the resilience of the whole system, uh, the role of, of trade, uh, uh, also again in, in accessing a number of uh, critical inputs uh, and critical uh, um, uh, pieces for mechanization, for example. Um, also, we have seen that uh, when we talk about resilience, it is also about the resilience system with respect to nutrition. So what can be done to make food systems more resilient, more resilient when uh, we, we, we know that the future shock is likely to again repeat the same pattern of of uh, pushing consumers to consume lower quality food uh, and at the expense of uh, uh, um, other products that are relatively more expensive. Next, please. So opportunities, and I will finish with that, is basic, basically uh, uh, we see COVID as, as a, a, an opportunity to actually look at a number of uh, over dimensions. So rebuild food systems may mean, you know, how to digitalize them a bit more when possible, how to actually uh, um, look at ways to produce not only or repeat the old paradigm of uh, abundant cheap food, but more nutritious food. Uh, 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 also look at the inclusive uh, inclusivity issues and, and look at you know, the role that women could play in rebuilding food systems, because we, we, we know that they have been heavily impacted and they have paid a high price, but they have probably a specific role to play and so on. So I, I, I think I am already short of time, but I think we need to look at all these uh, uh, diet diversifications as we build back better, looking at uh, uh, um, the resilience to climate change, because we can very much see these crises as a, a, a repetition for what could be the next climate crisis. Is there, is there anything that we can learn from this crisis that would make us better prepared uh, to actually uh, uh, deal with the climate crisis that is looming? And also to learn how to deal with, with these kind of solidarity cooperation networks in the, in the South. Next one. And I think this is my conclusion. I think that alone, we can achieve very little. So the point is we need collective efforts. Uh, and this panel represents the various stakeholders 
uh, that could actually work together uh, in, and I am proposing three, three main uh, areas. First, reduce the risk of occurrence and the direct impact, impacts of future shocks. So uh, we know that we can already identify a number of future shocks and we know that there are ways to mitigate these risks. Let's do it. Reduce adoption of detrimental responses. Uh, for example, we know that unilateral trade restriction uh, decision to close borders are just making the problem more difficult to address. So we have a collective action problem here that we need to address collectively um, and through cooperation networks rather than in isolation. Then last and not least, increase the capacity of different actors to anticipate and respond to shocks uh, in ways that could lead to uh, you know, uh, more uh, positive outcomes. So what I mean by that is we need to actually already understand that we cannot have a kind of linear approach and look at way to build back uh, systems uh, in a unidimensional way. We need to be conscious that we need to uh, address multiple challenges at the same time, ranging for, from sustainability to inclusivity to prosperity. And that makes our work much more difficult, but also the need to work uh, uh, together much more obvious. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Jean. Thank you uh, for, for sharing that, the work that you've been doing and your team has been doing. Nearly. I think it's quite interesting that uh, um, notwithstanding COVID-19, uh, in large parts of South Asia, for example, have suffered some of the worst floods in a very, very long time. So the uh, Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, uh, recently said that 75% of the country was underwater for much of August. Uh, similarly in Assam as well. Uh, large parts of it, it, it was underwater, but nonetheless, um, there was a, a FAO who just uh, produced some figures to show that the predictions are there's going to be a um, a record crop of uh, cereals. So, notwithstanding all the challenges, not only from COVID nineteen but also from uh, uh, climate change, farmers have pulled out all the stops. So they have responded and that's something that we should be very grateful for. Thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions on that. Um, conscious of time, let me move on to the uh, next speaker. It gives me great pleasure to uh, invite Dr. Husnain, who's the director of the Indonesian Center for Agriculture and Land Resources uh, Research and Development to give her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Husnain. Thank you, Nafis. Oh, help. I hope my voice is clear for you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Indonesia is now uh, six, uh, seven, almost seven the p.m. Uh, I'm going to present the mapping, the future of agriculture, the value of foresighting in building resilient agriculture programs. Uh, next, please. Uh, the, the coverage of the presentation is uh, including opportunity or challenge. Then how do we address the sources challenge and uh, how serious is the pandemic affecting Indonesian agriculture and for signing the research directive. And the challenge and opportunities, uh, uh, it include the increasing demand of food, energy and fiber products, market demands for high quality and green products and the climate change. Uh, next, please. This is uh, the roadmap of the Indonesian strategic food sufficiency uh, for the several commodities. This is a priority commodities in Indonesia. Uh, in this presentation, I will bring you a more a specific to Indonesian condition. The two earlier presentation is a more global, right? So uh, look and see here, we are performing better, performing well for the maize and rice but we still need to work very hard for the uh, soybean and sugar. So uh, this is a condition for uh, the targeting of our food self-sufficiency. And next, please. Next slide, please. So uh, during this pandemic uh, in Indonesia, the only uh, uh, growing sector is agriculture. It's uh, reached plus plus 19, 16.24% uh, 
we never imagined this, uh, but uh, uh, it's proof that agriculture is proven uh, can survive can survive in the critical condition like uh, now uh, during the pandemic COVID-19. And uh, how do we address uh, this challenge and opportunities? Uh, there are several programs we applied. Uh, we start from actually uh, since five years ago, more intense. Uh, uh, we can see here, uh, we start from the improvement of the irrigation network, mechanization to address labor shortage and aging farm labor, farm subsidies to uh, for fertilizer and seed. Also, we provide loans and insurance for farmers, intensification to close a yield gap, extensification to low carbon stock lands, implementation of climate smart agriculture, nutrient balance, cropping calendar, and technical guidance also for uh, farmers' skills. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. So how to deal with the climate change? Uh, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to combine the adaptation, action, and also mitigation. We cannot only uh, think about the mitigation. So in combining or synergizing the program action of the adaptation and mitigation, we can, get, uh, we can improve uh, uh, the resilience to the uh, agricultural productivity and also we can reduce the agricultural greenhouse gas emission. And next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows uh, how uh, we can inter uh, intervention, we, the intervention for both the adaptation and mitigation aspect. Uh, we can see some example here, uh, intermittent irrigation for rice field, uh, when the excess water uh, we can allocate it to the other area so we can uh, uh, we can have the more planting area in other places and also at the same time we can reduce uh, methane emission another example is uh, by uh, uh, maintain the balance uh, and efficient fertilization we can increase the uh, plant yield and also we can reduce emission from the fertilizers and another example, the improving the quality of animal feed with the increasing the population and the body weight of the livestock, we can reduce emission, methane emission from the enteric fermentation. And also another one, uh, maintaining the organic matter in the soil, we can improve the soil uh, properties, soil condition and the plant growth production. Then we can enhance the a carbon stock in the soil. This is what we call the synergizing, the adaptation and mitigation as aspect. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, related to the uh, the task of the ICARD, Indonesian Center for Land Resource uh, uh, Research and Development, we are providing a soil uh, database soil map, soil suitability map in the national and the farm scale. So this is uh, one example of the farm scale of the uh, land suitability map for uh, horticulture like potato and shallot and also garlic. I'm sorry, this map is Indonesian, so I just uh, make a, a picture and copy for you. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we provide the fertilizer recommendation, for example, like uh, here in this map, uh, with the different nutrients, uh, nutrient status uh, in the soil, we provide the different uh, fertilizer recommendation also. So we are going to uh, the more uh, site specific fertilizer recommendation. This is one example of the farm scale, the more, uh, the more detailed scale of the soil map. Okay, uh, next please. Organic matter is a still uh, uh, become our main issue in the, uh, in the, uh, the old soil, in the tropical soil like Indonesia and maybe also my, many other tropical countries. The maintaining organic matter in the soil is the key for the maintaining the soil fertility. So in our case, 
more than uh, more than 80 percent of our rice field are uh, contain less than two percent of organic matter so uh, it's uh, so it's really challenging that how we can improve the organic matter uh, content and maintain it in soil uh, in fact that we are still uh, providing the subsidy for this organic fertilizer until now so next uh, next please Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, the practical way of achieving nutrient, nutrient balance in the field is by using soil test kit. Uh, uh, back to the previous slide, please. Okay, this is a soil test kit we developed since um, maybe 15 years ago. We are using this simple kit to help the farmers we are providing this uh, soil test kit for uh, farmers in the group, for the extension services, and also for a local government to uh, make them uh, easy to get a, a recommendation for uh, its type of soil, its condition of soil. So we are already using this soil test kit, and uh, uh, it's related to the uh, uh, NPK, and urea subsidies by farmer. So this is a very important tool that we are using here in Indonesia. And uh, by uh, understanding by the uh, a pandemic situation, we have to go uh, digital, we have to go uh, the more uh, precision agriculture. So we are developed the soil sensor kit. This is a soil sensor that we are now uh, it's ready uh, to use that uh, at the final stage of the verification, validation, I mean. So we use this soil test kit to, uh, to detect the soil just by scanning the soil. We can get uh, information of the NPK, pH, and some uh, micronutrients. And we put the, uh, some software in the tab, in the, uh, the connecting tab, that uh, uh, include with the recommendation for several uh, commodities. For example, you can choose the paddy, maize, or um, uh, other uh, plantation crops. Then the, it's become uh, the fer fertilizer recommendation is become more easy and become become more efficient and uh, uh, costless. Next, next slide, please. So uh, integrated cropping calendar is also one, uh, another important Dr. delivery. Hussain, could I uh, interrupt, if I may interrupt? Uh, if you could draw to a close, that would be great. We, uh, we've got a, uh, we're uh, conscious of the time. Okay, okay, yes, I will make it fast. Uh, this uh, cropping calendar is the basic information of the program for a planting date. Uh, this program also uh, contain other information of the growth stage and uh, it's very essential for the fertilizer recommendation. So this is the information system we develop to help the farmer and also uh, decision maker and also uh, extension service. Uh, I think go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is one example. I will show you the how we decide the uh, the infrastructure and also uh, input for the agriculture. We can choose uh, the area, the province, and even the regency and sub-district. Then we can get the result that uh, when the uh, when they can start to plan, and and how much uh, the area they can uh, they can cover. So the center part of the map show rise it is at a measuring stage in district. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Uh, this is uh, how uh, we uh, monitor the huge area of the Indonesian agricultural land by uh, monitoring the rice growth stage, production, and also a fertilizer recommendation because we are still providing subsidy to all the Indonesian uh, agricultural area and also different uh, commodities. So uh, from this uh, system information, we can see that uh, uh, we provide the uh, uh, national level 
province, uh, district, and also sub district of the how how uh, how large the harvest area, and how much uh, rice production, and uh, how much uh, fertilizer required, and also uh, when uh, you can plant your pl uh, when you can start your plan because uh, with the Indonesian area we have the three part of the uh, uh, climate. Uh, the, in the west is more way, more uh, uh, high rainfall, and the, in the eastern it's uh, uh, very dry. So uh, this is uh, the the program that we have developed, and I think this is a more uh, successful uh, in terms of the uh, the how do we uh, uh, deal with the pandemic condition because we cannot uh, go directly to the field easily and the farmer can also cannot uh, uh, access uh, the information easily. So this is one way we provide to the farmer. Okay, uh, I think the time is... is uh, uh, thank you sorry. very much. For the, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Hussain, and thank you for sharing us, with us the important and very interesting work that you're doing. Um, our next speaker uh, is from the CGIR, uh, and uh, without further ado, can I uh, invite uh, Katerina uh, Krivonovos to uh, give her presentation on what the uh, CGIR system organization is doing in the COVID-19 hub. Uh, Katerina, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I right. can. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, I represent the system organization of CGR. And for those of you on the call who might not be very familiar with CGR, although I think probably most of you are, I just wanted to mention that the CGR is world's largest global agricultural innovation network. And we bring evidence to policymakers, innovation to partners, and new tools to harness economic, environmental, and nutritional power of agriculture. So having this unrivaled mix of uh, knowledge, skills, and research facilities is really placing us well to respond to emerging development issues, including shocks such as COVID-19. I will not go into the many impacts and uh, consequences of COVID-19 because my colleagues uh, on this panel have already done so. We are very well aware of the negative consequences the world is facing. And I will just really speak very briefly about what we're doing at the level of CGR to provide a more coordinated and integrated response to these challenges. So uh, when the crisis unfolded, of course, CG centers reacted very quickly through the existing programs and using the existing capacities to, with some agile research response. We have outlined these initial responses within that were taking place within the existing programs and projects in the research response paper that I think my colleague will now put in the chat. Uh, you will see a comment from Janet, and if you, you're welcome to check this paper because it really outlines in a lot of detail how in the short, medium, and long term, CGR is addressing these, uh, this crisis, helping countries to cope. And uh, as we move towards one CGR, so we are in a very intense project process of the, the dynamic reformulation of CGR's capacities, partnerships, knowledge, assets, global presence, institutional capacities. So this actually provides a very good opportunity for us to acting in a more coordinated way and really provide this one-stop shop to funders and partners who wish to engage with us as we provide our research support uh, at the global and country level. Next slide, please. So the COVID-19 hub, it's um, provides a coordinated research response to the global pandemic it convenes researchers, funders, and key stakeholders, and focuses on supporting national response and recovery work across CGR research themes. So what we're really targeting is to provide knowledge, of drawing from the wider organization, from the many strands of work, including, for example, the work that Iri is conducting and my colleagues already outlined, uh, for example, Jean and his intervention. So we really, uh, looking to tap into the existing capacities and provide emergency response, recovery, and resilience to reduce poverty, enhance food security, natural resource uh, management, and resilience to future shocks. The hub is host, uh, housed in the Agriculture and Nutrition Health Research Program, 
and that is led by, by IFPRI and ILRI and is also uh, in collaboration with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The hub has, uh, is utilizing significant resources that CGI already has. As I mentioned, we have data, tools, evidence, innovative solutions to respond to country demands. And it's also a, an entry point to our partners and funders to, and we did, uh, to, to collaborate with us, to provide funding and in a way that gives us an opportunity to act quickly, be transparent, be accountable for the resources that we have specifically for COVID-19 response. Next slide, please. In delivering this uh, urgent response, and this is really the hub is operational during 2020 and 2021, so we really don't have very much time to deliver this work, but we're focusing on four key areas where we see strong demand and, and a good match with capabilities of CGR. One is addressing value chain fractures. The second one is integrating a One Health approach to COVID-19 responses. Supporting country COVID res country responses is a third area. And the fourth is addressing food systems fragility and building back better. Next slide, please. When we look at addressing value chain fractures, what we really would like to achieve is to develop country and value chain and commodity specific case studies and collaborate uh, collaborative research to inform policy and investment decisions and design actions to restore food and agriculture value chains. One Health approaches are focused on assess, addressing urgent One Health issues, so specifically de-risking agricultural hotspots, avoiding future zoonoses and crossover events. And then another component is developing an integrated impact modeling, linking health, epidemiology, economics, and agri-food system modeling for a more um, comprehensive and inclusive um, scenarios and policy recommendations. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I will. We'd we like to move to slide? the. Yeah. I will, in any case, continue speaking. So please uh, move to the next slide when uh, when you can. As the country is so all these areas of work, of course, both of these areas, they're really linking very strongly to the country COVID-19 responses. We are we, we are targeting this establishing a responsive network across CGI partner countries, providing national partners with analysis, evidence-based recommendation, and scalable solutions for policy, strategies, and investment options for an integrated COVID-19 crisis and recovery response. So this is really drawing from the multiple um, areas of work, but focusing on country needs. In the fourth area, this is really a long-term view to, on fragility, on uh, resilience, and we're integrating foresight modeling results and other types of analysis to come up to assess value chain fractures and prioritizing solutions to improve resilience and building back better with special emphasis on vulnerable groups and country priorities. Each of these working areas has a working group attached to it that is uh, uh, from representing all the centers of CGR. So for example, Jean Vallier is a working group for resilience and we really value Iris contribution to that working group. And uh, next slide, please. For specifically for the country level response, what we're doing is we're engaging actively with governments and other national partners to respond to country demands we have set up two pilot country teams, one in Bangladesh and one in Ethiopia, and they are tasked with, um, with uh, carrying out a country engagement process for developing a 2021 research action plan specifically for COVID-19 response. Additional countries will be added in the future. This, these country teams draw on the existing work in the countries, but also CGI wider competencies and tools, as I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So just to give you a very quick picture of how what the process looks like. In fact, this country engagement for COVID-19 response is really a, a testing ground for us as CGR as we move to this um, integrated approaches as one CGR and we're strengthening our country engagement. So the, what we're doing in the COVID-19 hub is also kind of a model for how we will be working in the future through three distinct phases of country engagement. 
creating an enabling environment, developing the strategy and program through alignment and co-design with national partners, and then implementing the program and monitoring its effects. So each of these stages has specific um, collaborative uh, activities attached to it to make it really engaging, to make it truly a co-design. And this is how we see it uh, as going in the future, also for our future portfolio of research as CGR. Next slide, please. So what could it look like in practice? For example, I mentioned country team in Bangladesh. So here we already know that the first step is really having a good diagnostic outlining demand, supply, and feasibility of country 90 of COVID-19 research that CGR can provide with research gaps clearly identified. And then the synthesis of existing CGR research will really inform that. And then we move to dialogue for co-design to create an action plan for research activities next year and really drawing with objectives, key deliverables and drawing from our competencies, especially on social protection, economic modeling, one health, uh, gender and several others. Next slide, please. This country engagement process does not come out of nowhere. Of course, it's building on the existing networks, dynamic research collaboration with partners and coordination mechanisms that are already in place. So for example, in Ethiopia, we are really relying on the work of ILRI and other colleagues who are joined together in a single campus or, uh, under a hosting agreement with the Ethiopian government. There is a critical mass of researchers and labs and tools that are already providing long-term support to Ethiopia's agriculture and food systems transformation. So this provides us with a solid foundation for providing urgent support during shocks such as COVID. For example, initial assessments are already taking place on food security and nutrition, perishable food supply and dairy value chains, and conducting phone service on household resilience in Ethiopia's productive safety net program. Bangladesh, which is what you see here, again, this is already the country team consists of uh, CIMID, IRI, IFPRI, and World Fish. These are the centers that are um, working on the ground, but drawing from the wider expertise of the colleagues uh, across the globe. Um, they're working together now to go on through these steps that I outlined in the previous slide. So there are a number uh, of things are already taking place, for example, um, these four centers have already been working very closely with FAO and IFAD to prepare rapid assessments on food and nutrition security in the context, context of COVID-19. In fact, just yesterday, it was the new, the new publication was launched, which is outlines um, the, the impacts, uh, it offers lessons um, on the pandemic, recommendations, and presents forward-looking ideas about rebuilding food systems. So our country engagement will really build on that evidence and on these good collaborations, linkages, uh, buy-in from partners, understanding of what really the challenges are at the country level. So these are just a couple of examples. This work is new. We have started the hub in July and we're moving very strongly with these country teams and the four working groups. The um, COVID hub will also provide lessons learned for strategic partnerships and as inputs to the new research portfolio that CGR is currently developing. We are drafting a new 2030 research strategy and of course the issues of resilience, of risk management, of vulnerabilities, of being ready to face rapid changes, shocks and tipping points, this will be very much present in that research strategy. So this really provides us with the valuable lessons and enables us to work more efficiently on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Very, very in, uh, interesting and informative. Yeah, and it's amazing how you've done it so quickly, given that you started in July. So uh, yes, I think uh, I think that's a, that's commendable that we've been able as a as a, a one CGR to get this off the ground. Good. Uh, now, very conscious of time now. Uh, Faust, uh, may I uh, invite you to give your uh, uh, presentation? You may have five minutes at the end for a, a Q&A session. If people have questions, there is a Q&A chat box. So please do uh, uh, put your questions. If we can't answer them today, we will endeavor, I'm sure the panelists will be uh, happy to uh, and uh, uh, endeavour to uh, answer them uh, in uh, in due course. Thank you very much, uh, Katja. And if we move on to Foster, thank you. 
Thank, thank you, um, Mr. Moderator. And uh, I'm sorry I don't have a presentation, but uh, I will speak through it and uh, share some few insights about what AGRA is doing in uh, West Africa uh, with regards to uh, resilient uh, food systems. There are two things that COVID has taught us, innovation and initiative. These are two things that COVID has taught us. And uh, the interesting thing in West Africa is that, and I'm sure it also goes through for uh, some African countries, a COVID pandemic stroke at a time when uh, our continent or our sub-region was grappling with other challenges, including uh, nutrition, youth unemployment, climate change, and conflicts. Uh, we also realized that somehow the COVID has not been quite devastating as, as it is in, we anticipated uh, in, in, and it's happening in, in Europe and other places, um, but in terms of health-wise. But in agriculture and food, I think we are hard hit. Um, for us, we think that there, there's, um, this is evident that uh, Africa may have some resilience in terms of dealing with the COVID when it comes to health. The reason why we were not hard hit by the pandemic. But then it will also require some research into this phenomenon for hard evidence to guide future policy uh, 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 making decisions and also uh, coping strategies for resilient food systems in Africa. Now we've also think that we need to research into, we need to invest in research for resilient food system on two counts. One, we realize that there's inadequate evidence-based policy actions. Uh, that, con that constitutes another source of fragility in the, in the food systems in Africa, particularly in geographies with weak and early warning systems. Some geographies are very weak uh, uh, early warning systems and government don't have data to really anticipate some of these things. We also realize that global food supply chains also quite fragile due to their vulnerability to global food supply because uh, most of the smallholder farmers in West Africa, or in Africa, if you will, are uh, producing uh, below world uh, average in terms of productivity. They have very low productivity. And so it's, it's, it's a big challenge. We've also, yeah, we've also come to realize that um, Agra, uh, for us, there are three key areas that we are looking at in terms of dealing with uh, resilience and, and it's absorptive, capacity, how do we really strengthen absorptive capacity of countries? And what do I mean by that? Creating an enabling environment and regulatory environment for private sector investment. So public sector investment into infrastructure needs to leverage private sector investment to drive sustainable food system. But before you can do that, we, it needs to be based on evidence. All policy decisions must be based on evidence. And so therefore there's a need to invest in research to generate the analytics and data to inform decision making. Two, we also feel that we need to also invest in the area of adaptive capacity. How do you really capture, analyze, and share best practices on sustainable technologies, i.e. climate smart uh, post-harvest technologies, mechanization, and uh, also to ensure competitive and efficient production and supply chain for inclusive economic transformation you need to really share best practices. And as I said, there's a need for innovation and it calls for research. The last one is we're also looking at transformative capacity. How do we invest in that? What do I mean by that? We need to develop and promote uh, cutting edge technologies, including making available to smallholder farmers, uh, planting materials that, that have the right traits and in terms of genetic advantage to be able to deal with both biotic and abiotic stresses that farmers may face. We also need to look at issues to do with digitization, digital solutions to be able to take interventions to scale. Now that within COVID, you can have face-to-face -face interventions and uh, interactions with farmers. How do you really develop digital solutions in terms of digital extension, digital payment systems, market systems? How do we do that? And it calls for research. And then also the need to really strengthen uh, financial inclusion and capacity of SMEs to impact at scale. It's very critical and all require research. So for me, in conclusion, what I want to say is government alone cannot do it. There's a need for a concerted effort 
from government, private sector, uh, development partners, uh, non-state actors to be able to drive this agenda to ensure that we have a resilient food system. Thank you. That was brief, succinct, and very, very informative. Thank you very much for that. Now we have about 10 minutes left uh, for, for discussion. Um, now, I was curious about one thing that Foster said, and I would like to get the views from everyone on that, because certainly uh, it's something that when we think about smallholder farmers and the purpose of this uh, event is to is about what are the um, uh, lively what are the opportunities to future proof um, future proof the system and particularly in respect to smallholder farmers what he mentioned was the global food supply system is fragile so i want to put it to uh, our panelists uh, does that mean a change from global to local uh, rather rather than the other way around, which seemed to be the trajectory that we were going in. Who would like to uh, kick off on that? I can. Please. <clears throat> so I, I think Ariana wanted also to step in, so maybe I should give her the precedence. No, please, Jean, Jean, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait for it. I'll go okay, second. So no, I, I think Don't, this can is you turn very... your camera on, please? Ah, okay, yeah. In my camera, all right. Oh, okay, now you see me. And uh, I, I just, uh, no, I just would like to make a, a couple of points. Uh, Certainly, this is a very valid question. There are two, two, two clear trends. A long-term trend uh, that was basically, you know, um, support for liberalization through trade and so on, and so the uh, reliance on, on, on the global, uh, global well-connected, uh, integrated uh, uh, system, international system, with some sort of interdependence. And that clearly, has been has been challenged in recent years uh, and even before uh, the, the 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 COVID crisis. COVID crisis has basically exacerbated these these uh, new trends, more short term trend to relocalization, realizing that there are some area, areas of fragility that are linked to uh, uh, this global uh, supply chain value chains uh, with limited control. Uh, the, extent, the extent to which this is always true uh, can be debated because we have shown actually that uh, value chain and even global value chain have been incredibly uh, resilient, incredibly uh, effective at actually continuing to supply the food we need. Uh, that does not mean that the consumers have not uh, uh, adopted different uh, ways of looking at the, the, the consumption patterns. And, and in many instances we see that consumers have realized that they would sometimes express a preference for locally sourced food, uh, trying to reestablish a link with rural areas, trying to actually identify their consumption uh, 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 patterns with some other uh, objectives such as, you know, uh, uh, reconnecting with, with this, with this uh, uh, um, uh, yes, production uh, production systems and so on. So I think it, both both are true. Uh, I, I believe that in the northern hemisphere we already see clear clear signs that uh, local is increasingly beautiful, uh, but that doesn't mean that this is true for all the consumers. Uh, many cannot afford, you know, to actually pay the price of um, uh, local food, which is very often associated with, with higher quality, uh, probably more expensive processes, uh, not, not so big economies of scales. And, and so there are trade-offs, there are trade-offs, and we need to have policies to actually articulate this trade-off, make sure that uh, good food, uh, healthy food does not mean food for the, the richest, 
and, and that we also have a way to supply equally good food to the most vulnerable and those who do not have purchasing power. Thank you very much for that. Katya, you want to come in, did you, on that particular point? I mean, I'm curious to know in terms of CGI, if there is a, uh, 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 a re-evaluation re of the role of local food and local food, food supply chains, um, what would it mean for innovation and the work that CGI is uh, planning to do? I would say that we are, what we're looking at in, this, uh, in the process of developing the new research strategy is that to really achieve impacts across SDGs, it requires working through multiple pathways. So we cannot um, beforehand say whether we'll focus on local only approaches or that global markets solve everything, which is neither of these are certainly the case, but what we're looking at at context specific solutions and especially delivery mechanisms that can really truly benefit both uh, producers and consumers and public health and economic development. And that in different instances can mean different things. So we equally embrace, let's say, agroecological approaches, which have proven to be very valuable, especially recently gaining momentum, but also still very conscious that CGI strength lies in technology development. And we are equally relying on modern breeding techniques, for example. And that goes, the same goes for local versus global. It's uh, certainly, we cannot feed the world with pro local production alone. In fact, it makes um, it, uh, people much more vulnerable to really to, to limit their access to, to food through various channels. But, it, but we do have to strengthen both global markets Thank and local production. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Ariana, uh, representing the farmers, what would be your uh, perspective now, if I may, uh, I've got to close in a minute or so, if you could be brief, that would be brilliant. Sure, thanks, Nafis. I will be very brief, actually, from the farmer's perspective. So it's not about local versus global, not at all, uh, because we know that both the, low, the local production, I mean, having a strong agricultural sector in each country is vital, as well as having a balanced international trade flow. Uh, so both are relevant. From the farmer's perspective, there is one point, there's one note, one nexus, that is still to be sold. And that's value for the farmers in the long and in the short value chain. So, so far, the real issue is about not giving farmers the value for what they produce so that that food that in the end is sometimes affordable at very low cost with uh, uh, so, um, I mean, bad consequences for health and nutrition, that food, is not paid at the farm gate, not even covering the production cost. So to your point, is it about long or short? No, it's about fair value for the farmers. That was, uh, that was a, a very point, very force, forcefully and well made. And I think uh, it's right in the sense that uh, uh, we heard uh, earlier on from you that uh, uh, in many places around the world, we saw empty shelves in supermarkets for the first time in many, many years in many countries. That was the first time that was ever seen, which showed you the importance of food, the importance of farmers, and the importance of the production uh, and the food system as a whole. So I think with that, hopefully the, mes the message of food and nutrition security has got home to a lot wider group of people than, uh, than there's ever been before in recent times. Of course, in, in developing countries, it's always been an issue, for, but for many people in the more uh, affluent countries, you went to supermarkets and there was abundance. So that image of empty shelves, hopefully, is an image that will resonate for, for at least this year uh, 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 and for a few years more. Right, we've come to the end. We, I'm sure there would have been lots and lots of questions had we uh, had a little bit more time, but alas, I think uh, we've uh, expired our slot. So may I uh, close by thanking everyone, all the panelists um, for their contributions, for their insights. Uh, this is an issue that is hugely important. We will be uh, pulling together discussion and 
pulling together a synthesis uh, in the next few days and, and, um, uh, and sharing that with everybody who wishes to uh, see that. Uh, so my colleagues uh, from Erie HQ will be uh, uh, putting out a link for that. And of course, as uh, Cathy said, there's been this new document that's produced by SEGIR, the second uh, uh, rapid assessment of food and nutrition security. So that's available. She's seen that. So uh, let me say thank you very much. Thank you for all the participants. I hope you found this useful. I hope you found this interesting. I can say for myself, uh, I certainly did. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.